Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend. Let us head fanfics. Back with amazing fanfiction. This is the series part of. What if Deku went insane? Now before starting, please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. Abuse, it seemed, was much like exercise. It hurts at first, feeling it, experiencing it, until one grew used to it. Train the mind and the body to adapt and overcome and be able to take more and more without feeling dot 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 well, anything. Midoriya could remember a time when it hurt so much, back when it was still fresh. His best friend and closest companion would say something mean that would break his little heart, would push him down and leave a scrape or a bruise and leave him too stunned to cry. Soon, he got used to it. He would let insults pass over him, pick himself right back up after being pushed and continue to pursue Katsuki Bakugo. And like any good exercise routine, upping the ante with the abuse became necessary for points to get across. Insults became more cutting and personal. Pushes and shoves became punches and kicks. Rush it off, get back up. Rinse and repeat for another ten years. Through it all, Midoriya could feel swells of emotion so bitter it made him choke, and he forced it down, burying it with shame. This wasn't him, he rationalized to himself. He wasn't a hateful, bitter person. He was just a useless, quirkless, worthless, good for nothing. Deku, bury it all, salt the earth, don't let it out. Smile, he was better than this, and it was better this way. Keep being kind, don't lash back, and Kakan will stop yelling at him, would stop hurting him, every time he thought about it. Old phantom wounds places where Bakugo had hit him, kicked him, or burned him would itch. He used to think about it a lot, to the point where his mother would look over and see him scratching at his shoulder while trying to focus on homework. She would find no scabs or abrasions or sign of disease. But Midoriya still had to convince her not to make an appointment with the doctor, internally cursing himself for making her worry. So he trained himself out of thinking about it. Bury that away too. Salt the earth. Smile. Rinse and repeat. He gets into UA and Bakugo corners him, slams him against the wall, and punches his shoulder after Midoriya stands up for himself for once. After he leaves, Midoriya rubs his chest where he was punched. It itched. Bury it bury it bury it. After their first mock battle, his left arm still burns even after a full recovery kiss from recovery girl. His fatigue making his mental training slip and remembering everything Bakugo yelled at him in the simulation. It itched. So bad. Bury it salted bury it. Thankfully, a reprieve after that. It made the sports festival, his internship, and even Stain seem like a mental vacation. His smile felt lighter, his body following suit, without a care or an itch to the world, all up to the midterm exam. And then, Midoriya, you will be paired with Bakugo. The rest of Aizawa's statement in All Might's entrance was fuzzed out with mental static. His whole body, I too chied. When Bakugo glared at him, he fought back the itching and forced himself to watch the other matches. He his was dead last and while he didn't have the opportunity to convene with Bakugo about a strategy, he could at least think of one himself. Little by little, the matches wound up, clock ticking down to his own as the swell in his chest got larger, the static louder, and the itching stronger. Finally, it was his turn. With years of practice, Midoriya fought back the anxiety that buzzed under his skin and the pounding of his heart, heading to ground beta for his exam. As he stepped closer seeing Bakugo's back in the short distance, he forced himself to not recognize his anxiety reaching peak levels. He forced himself to not acknowledge the phantom pain of every blow of the past ten years inflicted onto his body by the other boy. His fists clenched, forcing them to stay concealed in an attempt to disregard the almost painful itching sensation over his heart. Bakugo turned his head and glared at him. He really, really, itched. The exam began. Talking a mile a minute forced the itching away. He had come to find over the years. Mumble over the itching, drown the demands out. He did the same here, attempting to reason with Bakugo as a last-ditch effort. Stop following me. Midoriya reflexively flinched. That tone and volume level were indication of pain ahead, but this was an exam. It wasn't even graded so much as pass or fail. And for once for once Midoriya just wanted to collaborate without a fight. He swallowed down his fear and anxiety. Though he felt his patience begin to strain. If we keep going straight, All Might will be right there waiting for us. We need to find a detour. Why the F should I avoid him? Bakugo snapped, keeping his pace and not deigning to look at Midoriya. We need to avoid direct battle at all cost. Midoriya pleaded back. Kakin, I'll toy around with him until he's tired, and then I'll blast his ass out. Bakugo snarled, fists tightening. Midoriya's patience thinned even further, his anxiety simmering right at the top at the idea of actually having full contact battle with All Might. Just who do you think we're fighting, Kakin? It's All Might, even with the handicap he has, you can't even hope to beat him. He didn't even see Bakugo turn around until the other boy's gauntlet was smashed into his face, sending him flying back into the road. 
Midoriya was hardly aware he was on the road until the pain finally crashed into him, the sensation of blood dripping from his nose trickling in through the pain. His hand shakily raised to his face which was transitioning from impact pain to static numbness that spread over his entire head, rendering him almost deaf and blind to it. Even so, through the static he could hear Bakugo speaking. Not another goddamn word, you sit. Just because things are going good for you doesn't mean that you should speak to me. Words literally spat from his mouth down to Midoriya, permeating his thoughts lower than the dirt Midoriya had buried a decade's worth of feeling deep down, unearthing it all in a foulness that almost made Midoriya wretch and how badly it had aged over the years. The memories were almost tangible like pieces of rotted corpses of the past, permeating everything in a way Midoriya couldn't ignore, couldn't rebury. Deku, freak, quirkless, worthless, take a swan dive off of the roof and pray for a quirk in your next life. No more no more stop stop please stop no more please please stop stop stop. No more. No more. Midoriya crawled over the road aimlessly like a blinded dog run over, unable to breathe from the hit he'd taken that unearthed everything he tried to keep buried. Shallow, retching breath soaked with tears pouring from his eyes as he dragged his worthless carcass away, digging his fingers into the road to keep from scratching. His whole body, everything, was one. Big. Itch. He retched again, scraping the side of his face against the street as he crawled, trying and failing to make the itch stop. A shockwave of air sent him tumbling back further from where he'd started the exam, his body crashing against a parked model car. He didn't couldn't register pain, only the desire to make the itching stop. No exam, no kakin, no all might. Only the thought of getting rid of it all drove him to keep crawling away, past the ache in his body, past the cut on his face from smashing into the side mirror of the model car, past the distance unmistakable boom of all might's voice carrying across the entire field. His encompassing itch flared more violently, halting his escape in order for him to retch again, this time coming up with what very little he had to eat earlier as his gloved hands began clawing at his clothes in earnest. Make it stop make it stop make it stop stop s-t-o-p-s-t-o-p-s-t-o-p-s-t-o-p. He began crying out in a mixture of pain and anger, his voice strained from retching and constriction that locked his body up in a fit of itching. Frustration clawed further into his brain at being unable to fix it, scraping his face and body against the street more violently since his gloved hands weren't doing him any favors. More tears poured from his eyes and anxiety strangled him again as the suffocation of being enveloped by the unrelenting itching began to close in on him. And when he felt hands on him, all hell broke loose. Everyone in the observation room all gave a collective wince and sympathy pain when they saw Bakugo back and Midoriya full force with his gauntlet, murmuring among one another about Midoriya's misfortune at having to work with Bakugo in the first place and wondering what form of strategy they could even utilize to go up against All Might himself. While the students speculated, recovery girl's brow furrowed when she saw Midoriya remain on the ground, squinting and pressing a button to zoom the camera in for a closer look. Midoriya's eyes suddenly glazed and looked entirely not all there, his chest and shoulders lurching like he was dry heaving as his hands began bracing to crawl in the opposite direction that Bakugo was headed. He wasn't even pulling himself up, she saw, worry beginning to gnaw alarmingly fast up her spine. Midoriya was literally crawling away, scraping his body along the ground as his shoulders and back continued to heave. A hit to the face couldn't have possibly done something to warrant this, she rationalized, her hand reaching for the emergency stop button on the simulation at the same time that All Might punched a shockwave into the arena. All Might, emergency ceasefire. She shouted into the comm used exclusively for emergency stops. Her eyes widening when she saw Midoriya crash headfirst into a model car. She stood up quickly, grabbing her medical kit and pulling up other teachers. Everyone get to field beta immediately. We have an emergency. She turned to Ida. Ida, get me there as quickly as you can run. Ida didn't ask questions, immediately scooping her up and taking off running for the field. Recovery girl, what's the cause for a ceasefire? All Might demanded from his calm, having had to use a forceful tone with Bakugo to get the boy to stop when the emergency alarm called for it. It's Midoriya, recovery girl said quickly. I can't be sure how or why until I get there, but something's seriously wrong with him. Try to keep him from moving or hurting himself until I get there. She paused, and keep Bakugo away. What? Just do it, boy. All Might winced at the volume of her voice in his earpiece, turning to Bakugo. Young Bakugo, stay here. He commanded. We're under an emergency halt to the exam. We'll let you know what's going on later. He left the boy where he was and ran up the street's pathway toward the entrance to the field, feeling his non-existent stomach lurch when he saw Midoriya sprawled on the ground, writhing on it and scraping his body against the rough asphalt as though in pain. His worry didn't abate when he saw a smear trail of blood starting from a dented model car lead to where the boy currently was. Young Midoriya. He called over before reaching him and kneeling down, fighting down his panic to assess the situation carefully. There was only a cut on Midoriya's head that he could see. 
and he knew that head wounds bled more without being very serious as a rule, and saw that nothing on Midoriya looked particularly broken in any way. Nothing that could warrant the boy acting this way. An unseen head injury came to mind, which did nothing for his worry. He honestly didn't know how he would make Midoriya stop scraping himself against the asphalt without further injuring himself. To make matters worse, Midoriya was crying and making sounds like a strangled animal, all while making no indication that he was aware that All Might was there. Young Midoriya, please. All Might murmured, reaching out to at least unhook Midoriya's clawing fingers from his own arm lest he cause some muscle damage. But the moment his hand touched Midoriya's shoulder, he was assaulted with the sound of screaming. Not normal pain screaming or even angry screaming. It was strangled and inhuman, accompanied by Midoriya's arm lashing out with enough force to knock All Might back before the boy began clawing at the ground to crawl away in an apparent escape. All Might righted himself and scrambled after the boy, calling out for him to please stop moving and injuring himself before looking up to see Ader running in with Recovery Girl in his arms. The other boy skidded to a halt to put Recovery Girl down before rushing over to Midoriya despite the woman's calls of warning. Young Ida, Midoriya, what's happening? Ada cried, reaching out for his friend and not half a moment later suddenly being violently assaulted by the other boy. Midoriya had seen the hand and lurched out toward its owner, feeling a decade's worth of rage flaring up and breaking out as he attacked back against his supposed aggressor. He grabbed, he clawed, he hit, he punched, screaming like a man possessed until stronger hands grabbed him and pulled him away. Hold him, recovery girl shouted over Midoriya's screaming, unable to get closer with Midoriya being clutched fighting in All Might's hold like a rabid feral cat. All Might tightened his arms around Midoriya, wincing in pain as the boy clawed and slammed his fists into his arms and kicked hard against his thighs, all while the boy was screaming and retching in a full psychotic breakdown. He could feel a telltale crackle of power indicating that Midoriya was close to tapping further into one for all to do whatever it took in getting loose, and prayed wholeheartedly for Aizawa to hurry in. Prayers answered just as Midoriya reached back and almost gouged his eyes out, prompting him to let go. Midoriya pitched forward into the street, still heaving and retching as he scratched fruitlessly at his body, sobbing in rage, frustration, pain, and confusion. Aizawa jumped out of the car that present Mike had driven up and activated his quirk toward Midoriya before snapping his capture weapon out to ensnare him. Midoriya's screaming picked right back up as he jerked at the weapons, his muscles straining to get loose even without one for all's help. Grab him, Aizawa snapped to All Might, who held Midoriya tightly in his arms again while Midnight hurried out unlooping the end of her skin-tight piece from her finger. Keep his head steady, she instructed, lending a hand and helping All Might hold Midoriya's head still as she pressed her exposed hand to Midoriya's face, letting her sleeping mist do its work. Midoriya still heaved and struggled, attempting to bite her once before he began to go lax, shaking hard as sleep began overtaking him. Recovery girl fished out a syringe of an emergency sedative, waiting for Midnight's all clear of Midoriya being out before carefully walking over and injecting it into the boy's shoulder. Midoriya went limp in All Might's hold, and the sudden jarring stillness almost made everyone too afraid to move if it meant interrupting it. Little by little, they finally moved. All Might loosened his hold around Midoriya for Aizawa to pull his capture weapon back while Recovery Girl attending to Ida, who was already bruising from Midoriya's blows. She told him to stay where he was until she was sure of no immediate concussion before turning to All Might. Get him back to the school and straight to the infirmary, she commanded before turning to Aizawa. I'm certain the other children have seen more than enough through the observation room. Go keep them calm. All Might scooped Midoriya up, keeping him close as he hurried back to the car, Midnight keeping close by in case the sedative failed for some reason. Aizawa helped Ida upright and looked out at Bakugo, who had apparently gotten tired of waiting and followed the sound of screaming all the way back to the entrance but remained out of the way. Let's go, Bakugo, Aizawa said. Bakugo stalked over, looking more confused than his usual perpetual irritated expression. Dot 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 the FS going on, he demanded. We don't know. Silence. What about the exam? Aizawa's jaw flexed. We'll think of something, he replied. Recovery girl was quiet, mulling over what she had seen and not quite liking where her train of thought was going. Midoriya had only been struck by a blow that was almost a love tap by Bakugo standards, but it somehow devolved into a full-scale psychotic fit. Whether it was quirk-related or entirely mental, neither reason would be anything to deal with. Bakugo, she spoke up, getting the boy's attention. Until we know what exactly is going on, do not physically or verbally engage Midori. Bakugo scowled. TCH, like I'd want to. B-A-K-U-G-O. Her tone shut him up quickly, as did the sharpness in her glare. Do not. Physically or verbally engage Midori. Am I clear? The boy pursed his lips as though keeping himself from making a reflexive biting retort and only gave a curt nod. Recovery girl let that be. And began mentally preparing herself for the state Midori would be in when he would finally wake up. 
Aizawa sat with his head in his hands, feeling the mother of all migraines popping up and refusing to abate as he went over the past couple of days and what he was supposed to do now. As of yesterday, Midoriya had finished his individual exam with flying colors and was on standby to see whether or not Aizawa would be allowing him to go on the training camp trip, and the day before that, 14 hours after Midoriya had to be sedated, he woke up with no memory at all of what had transpired after the exam started. Do you remember anything? Anything at all? Recovery girl asked, somewhat worried by the fact. Midoriya sat in the bed, frowning at his sheets for the longest time before shaking his head no. I really don't, he replied earnestly. I mean, I was nervous, yeah, but nervousness didn't put someone into a psychotic rage, Aizawa thought as he listened in. He had rewatched the footage from the start of Midoriya's exam and saw that everything had gone to sit after Bakugo had hit him. Recovery girl had already ruled out a grand mal seizure for the most part, so indeed a psychotic fit was all that was left to go by. What worried them most was Midoriya's actions before and after being touched, with the boy looking like he was trying to escape something and then fighting for his life when he couldn't. And after all of that, he didn't remember anything, and didn't appear to be suffering anything more than a loss of recollection of that brief moment of time. Aizawa watched the footage several times over, keeping a keen eye out for any details. Nothing much was out of the ordinary, Midoriya being a ball of nerves from both the exam and being paired with Bakugo. Bakugo being his usual rabid lone wolf self, and Midoriya seeming to try to talk some sense into the other boy before being violently rejected. It was like a switch had been flipped right after, in a way that Aizawa definitely did not see even from their first mock battle when Bakugo did much more than hit the boy in the face. Midoriya had mentally shut down, going purely on fight or flight. Dot 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 and he was scratching himself a lot. Aizawa frowned as he watched through another time, seeing Midoriya using the street asphalt as a means to scratch at his face and body, using his hands when that didn't do much. His heaving and retching in between crawls, not reacting to anyone's voices, and losing his mind when touched made Aizawa think of a massive overreaction to anxiety. He went back to watch again, seeing that Midoriya's hands unconsciously went to his chest as he pursued Bakugo, possibly to scratch then too. Anxiety that took a swan dive into psychotic mayhem with one hit. This wasn't something that just happened to occur. This was something that was long built up, festering until it emerged as a mental breakdown. Most concerning was how Midoriya just didn't remember anything, and now didn't appear to have any lingering effects. Yet, his instincts warned him. There were other factors at play, most specifically concerning Bakugo. Bakugo had been the one to trigger this fit, and Bakugo was the only constant in Midoriya's past to build up on the mental fatigue. It put Aizawa's teeth on edge and a lead of guilt in his gut, thinking that he was doing them a favor in making them work through whatever animosity it was for the exam, when in reality he had put an open flame next to a leaking sack of gunpowder. This wasn't a rivalry. Rivalries weren't one-sided and, upon looking for the umpteenth time from both the exam start and the mock battle from before, abusive. There was no other way to really describe it. Katsuki Bakugo was behaving absolutely abusively toward Midori. If this happened now, it was certain to happen again. One didn't just have a psychotic breakdown and move on without further incident or mental scars. Midoriya had simply compartmentalized the incident away and would be in need of real psychiatric help. But for now, he already informed the class that everyone was going to the training camp with Siro, Ashido, Kaminari, Sato, and Kirishima attending the extra lessons as well. It would do no good to keep Midoriya from improving himself, but now he had to fit in specialization for the boy in case he had another fit. At the moment, training his body to better house his strength would take precedence over combat. That way someone coming at him on the offensive wouldn't trigger another attack. Tiger was an intimidating powerhouse, but he was also a rescue hero who could make himself non-threatening if need be. Still, Aizawa was teetering on the idea of bringing Ryo and Yui with them as a backup. As a guidance counselor, the man was oddly gifted with knowing which students were on the verge of panic attacks, even in a crowd. He would be able to sense when something was up before anyone and give a sign to clear the area. Any further incident, however, and Midoriya would be sent back home immediately. It was bad enough that Mrs. Midoriya was already a worried mess. While she had been advised against watching the footage, she insisted upon it and had been horrified at what she saw. It was made even worse that her son didn't remember a thing about it and insisted that he was fine. Midoriya himself did not see it, for fear of triggering whatever it was again. The ones who had watched in the observation room were forbidden from discussing it by Aizawa and Recovery Girl. Though Aizawa saw flashes of mutiny on more than one face, most notably Todoroki. The boy looked positively murderous at the mention of Bakugo and Aizawa found himself surreptitiously guiding Bakugo away entirely from the rest of the class just to avoid that sort of encounter. When Aizawa told the class that Midoriya was awake and unaware of what had happened, he saw Todoroki visibly heave a silent sigh of relief. Soon after, he saw Todoroki and Ida having a quiet conversation alone, 
where Todoroki looked almost pleading while Ida was reassuring. Aizawa didn't know what it was the boys were talking about, and he didn't want to intrude on it when it seemed all was well. Midoriya would be back in class after the summer break, though Aizawa already had a seat change in mind, having already asked Ayama to change seats with Midoriya. Ayama was oddly serious and silent as he agreed and went on his way to get ready for the trip. When everyone was filed out, Aizawa decided to take the time to figure things out on his end, praying nothing else would go wrong between now and the camp trip. Midoriya had told a small fib when asked about the supposed experience during the exam. He did remember something. Itching. At first thought, it didn't seem like something that important to bring up. But the more Midoriya thought about it, the more it sort of aided him, recalling back in the past with little detail of recollection of the actual memory. Except that he ITCHED. And the more he thought about it now, the more he realized that the mental barrier he'd put around that particular tick was almost non-existent. And when he thought about his past, thought about what he had supposedly done in the exam, he found himself scratching at his chest through his shirt, and he thought about it a lot. Still, he didn't want to stay away from his schoolwork. He didn't want to be punished for something he didn't even remember doing. And if he did have a mental setback, he didn't want to be cowed by it. He wanted to overcome it. It was why, when Yuraka extended the invite to go to the mall with the bulk of class to shop for things they needed for the training camp, he accepted right away. In hindsight, his mother deserved better than a text telling her where he was going to be when he was meant to be recovering at home. But he felt too desperate for some semblance of normalcy for much else. He grabbed the short train ride into the city and made it to the rendezvous point where he saw his classmates, hurrying up with a wave. Hey, he called over, I'm here, and right away, though he received some smiles back, he knew that his presence was not a good one in the group. Yuraka's smile was too strained. Ida wouldn't look him in the eye. Takoyami was keeping a definite distance from him, eyeing him almost warily. Even Kirishima's ever-present friendliness didn't quite reach his eyes. Discomfort hung over them like a miasma that made Midoriya. Itch, no no no, not now, not here with his friends. Hagakir, to her credit, at least tried to pep everyone up, calling out for who needed what and where they had to go and to meet back at three for group lunch. But that seemed to backfire on Midoriya's behalf when everyone began parting out in pairs or teams, leaving him with Yuraka. He turned to her, at least trying to salvage his day. Everyone sure left in a hurry, he remarked, trying to keep his voice light and his hands from touching at his itching skin. Yuraka nodded a little, shifting her bag straps. Yeah, she replied half-heartedly. Midoriya's skin was crawling. Dot 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 do you dot 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 need anything close by? He asked, unable to stop his hand from scratching lightly at his abdomen. I mean, there's a bug spray. Yuraka yelped suddenly, turning to a random direction. I need bug spray. She hurried off, leaving Midoriya alone, and almost in agony with the itching. His hands shook, feeling a familiar lump in his throat that was always connected to his crying. This time it being exacerbated with the godham awful itching that came with being invited only to be abandoned. He swallowed back his tears, fought back the incessant static that began clouding at his peripheral as he nearly curled into himself, fingers trailing to his collarbone to scratch. Freak. Useless. Worthless. Deku. He could feel the swell in his throat cut off his air, the static getting worse as his vision began to blur and the itching grow worse. He felt like the entire world was looking at him through a microscope. Yet he felt like he wasn't even real, like nobody could see him, see his suffering. Please. He whimpered under his breath, close to hyperventilating in the middle of the mall. Would anyone see him before he died of asphyxiation? Would anyone help? Would anyone care? The itching was getting worse and his fingertips began to feel damp, his vision close to black. And then he felt someone physically move his body. Half walking half dragging it out from the middle of the walkway into an out of the way hallway that led to an emergency exit. The enclosed space somehow feeling like he had been pulled into an open valley full of more breathing space. All before he dropped to his knees, gasping for breath and scratching even worse at his chest. Easy, came a soft, rough voice that cut through the static in his brain. The voice being accompanied by a hand clasping over his fingers to halt their scratching. He whined, tugging at his hand but the cold hand around his own didn't give. Curl your fingertips in, the voice said, using his own fingers to physically move Midoriya's fingertips inward. Use the blunt of your nails if you're going to scratch that much. Saves you a mess. Midoriya absently took the unsolicited advice, desperate for anything just to get relief from the itching at least a little. He slumped down to the floor, leaning his head forward to try to control his breathing as he continued to scratch with the blunt of his nails, still getting the sensation of momentary relief without the excess tearing. Being uninterrupted from his scratching cleared his head a little, making him aware that he was sitting on the floor in the emergency exit hallway, away from the crowd that wasn't giving him so much as a second look, possibly because of the bigger person dressed in black sitting between him and the side of others, almost shielding him from view. Midoriya swallowed hard, finally making some of that lump in his throat go away as he peered to the side, looking at the figure from behind his hair. 
Familiar red eyes stared back at him from beneath a hoodie, being framed by pale blue hair. Even in his half-panicked state, Midoriya knew who it was, and yet still couldn't find it in himself to give even half of a damn. So this is how I die, he thought to himself, having a nervous breakdown in the mall, and crumbled into flesh chunks in the emergency exit hallway. It would be long after 3 o'clock that anyone would notice he was missing, dead, and in the janitor's cleanup bucket. The depressing thought did no favors for the itching making him stare down at his scratching hand and noting smears of blood on his fingertips. He let out a soft sob, clenching his eyes shut and leaning his head back against the wall. Dot 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 stop dot 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 he hissed to himself between his clenched teeth. Dot 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 stop please stop stop the itching please. His fingernail caught his flesh, tearing a scratch open again. Stop. Shigaraki's hand pushing his head back down broke off his mantra. Breathe, the man ordered. Fixing the itch comes later. Midoriya didn't quite know what Shigaraki was talking about. But it made enough sense to listen as he ignored what his hands were doing and instead focused on breathing. Ignore his hands. Ignore the crowd just meters away. Ignore the literal villain next to him. Just breathe. 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 He took a deep breath in and let it out. The static in his brain clearing and shoulders slumping as he repeated it again. Aware enough now that he was still itching but not as overwhelmingly so. His fingers curling to the blunt again to avoid hurting himself so badly. Breathe. And so he did. His fingers slowed to a near lazy crawl over his chest as he let out a shaky sigh and swallowed past his dry mouth. Dot 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 okay dot 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 he said, mostly speaking to himself. Okay, I'm okay, I'm okay I'm okay. The hand that never left his head after leaning it forward gave something akin to a ruffle to his hair before receding. Shigaraki tucking the hand into his hoodie pocket to join his other. The villain was contemplatively silent for the longest time as he eyed Midoriya over with a shrewd yet thoughtful look, something like fate or destiny or any of that crap. Shigaraki thought that he had come to this mall just to clear his scrambled thoughts and instead caught sight of the damn green-haired kid that was in the top 5 spot of his sit list. His initial idea to go any talk to the boy, perhaps get a word or two in while making a declaration of death was shattered when he saw the boy suddenly slip into a state that was far too familiar for Shigaraki to find comfortable even looking. Shigaraki saw deep. Internal loathing clouded the boy's eyes, a panic blind to everything around him close him off to the outside world, and then came the excoriation. It was a gesture so familiar that Shigaraki felt it was almost unique to him and him alone. And yet Midoriya was doing it. The boy had that very same itch. He could tell. He knew. There was something Midoriya wanted to do. Wanted to say. Wanted to hurt. To destroy. And it was buried so deep down. The only way else to get it out was to claw it out. Out of all of UAS finest. Shigaraki didn't expect this all might wannabe self-sacrificing heroing to be the one to have that very same itch that he himself had. You never really know with the goody-goody types, he thought. Eyes narrowing as he watched the boy settle himself down. He wasn't a fool, though. While Midoriya's face and boy were relaxing, Shigaraki could see it in the boy's viridian eyes that the itch was still there. And from personal experience, it wouldn't go away until what caused it would go away. Dot 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 who hurt you, Izuku Midoriya? He found himself murmuring. Only knowing that he did so out loud when Midoriya looked at him, a mild confusion clouding the haunted gleam in his eyes. Dot 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 too many, Midoriya replied. I hate it. I hate it so much. His eyes filled with tears. His scratching quickening. I thought it stopped but then Kakin dot 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 he dot 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 h dot 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 he dot 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 he swallowed hard, feeling a slight wretch coil up his chest as the vaguest shadow of a memory began unearthing itself. Dot 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 he dot 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 what dot 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 what did I do wrong? His itching worsened. Breathe, Shigaraki flippantly reminded, his eyes staring unblinking at the boy's shaking form. You're talking about Katsuki Bakugo, yeah. Midoriya nodded, clenching his eyes shut as he mentally beat the memory back with a shovel. Dot 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 it was him. I don't dot 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 and no one will tell me what I did dot 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 and no one will talk to me dot 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 they invited me here, just to ditch me. He scratched harder, tears streaming down his face. What did I do what did I do what did I do? Breathe, Shigaraki slipped his hand out of his hoodie pocket to push Midoriya's head down again. Ten words or less between breaths. Midoriya took several breaths before his scratching slowed again. He was quiet for some time after before peering out from the corner of his eye. Dot 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 why are you doing this? He finally asked, sounding so much younger than he was. Shigaraki sucked his teeth, scowling at himself as though the thought had just occurred to him as well. Hell if I know, he muttered, his other hand reaching up to lightly scrap his fingernails against his scarred neck. Dot 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 but it isn't every day I see someone like me. He paused for the inevitable retort of I'm nothing like you. But it never came. Midori elapsed into his own silence, his hands finally stilling over his collarbone before they dropped into his lap. Dot 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 does it ever stop? He asked quietly. He felt Shigaraki's hand flex slightly in his hair. Dot 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 not until what caused it is gone, Shigaraki replied bitterly. 
Dot 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 take it from someone who's been itching for 15 years. It's hell. Pure, unbridled hell. He looked down at Midoriya, eyes almost like red ice. Dot 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 do you know the hell I must feel then? Midoriya dot 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 is someone who hates everything and wants everything to disappear. Midoriya's eyes filled with tears again. Agony, he answered. Dot 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 that it'll never go away. His hands twitched again. And he felt four of Shigaraki's five fingernails flex into his scalp. That's right, Shigaraki said quietly. Agonizing hell. And here you are. One small finger away from being one less thing in this world I hate gone. What will you do about it? Midoriya was silent. The tension in his shoulders almost making him like stone before he finally slumped. Something in his eyes died. Dot 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 it would make the itching stop. Wouldn't it? He said, his voice thick with bitterness and bile. Dot 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 and no one would notice I was gone until a janitor or something found me. I was. Before you came, I was dot 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 and no one. His breath hitched. Dot 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 they brought me here and left me dot 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 and then on one saw me dot 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 and no one helped. He buried his face in his hands. I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't know what I did wrong. I just hurt an itch and I just. I just. You want to hurt him. Shigaraki's fingernails let go of Midoriya's scalp, his eyes softening into something a little more thoughtful. Dot 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 that's it, isn't it? That it headed brat. I'll bet he's an old childhood playmate, isn't he? And that this isn't something new and recent that he's done? Ha. Huh. He leaned in closer, smiling. You itch because he's under your skin. Because he hurt you and no one stopped him. Well let me tell you, Izuku Midoriya. He made sure Midoriya was listening. Dot 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 and no one will stop him. No one did before. And no one ever will. Until you stop him yourself. Midoriya looked at him, eyes confused but intrigued. Dot 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 wa. And anyone else who feels like they can hurt you. Shigaraki continued, his hand lightly ruffling at Midoriya's hair. I know that with your disposition it's not just Bakugo who thinks they can walk all over you. Anyone who hurts you will crawl under your skin and irritate the sit out of it until you make them stop. Red locked onto green, completely serious. They won't tell you what you did, because they know what you can do if they get under your skin. Why would they have any reason to fear you if they did nothing wrong, HM? Did they stop Bakugo from hurting you before? No, then they won't ever. His smile widened, half-healed wounds on his lips cracking open again. Plenty have gotten under my skin. Midoriya dot 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 and I would be a pile of scratched up flesh ribbons if I didn't make the itching they cause go away. He ruffled Midoriya's hair again before withdrawing his hand and standing up, staring down at Midoriya. Dot 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 of course, that's all up to you, he said with a shrug. I've only had 15 years to know what I'm talking about. But, because I know just how hellish it is, and that I'm not that garbage of a person to just let you suffer as I do. His expression went calculated for a moment. Dot 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 when you feel you want to make the itching stop dot 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 go to the mountain. He didn't give Midoriya a chance to ask what he meant before turning and walking off into the crowd easily vanishing within it from view. Midoriya remained where he was for the longest time, mulling over everything before taking out his cell phone with shaking hands and sending a message to his class group chat, not feeling up for it today. Headed home, he stood up and walked out of the mall in silence. Not one person noticed his scratched up chest and bloody shirt, and if they did, no one stopped to see if he was okay or if they could help. Not one, not for the first time, Aizawa wondered if he was making the right choice here. It didn't really matter that Midoriya gave him a convincing argument of needing to move on and get stronger and that being treated with baby gloves wasn't going to do anyone any favors. Something was just rubbing Aizawa the wrong way. It came to a head when everyone crowded around to wait for time to go. And Midoriya was dropped off by his mother rather than coming himself, in order for her to speak to Aizawa and Inui privately. I really didn't want him to go, she said, glancing back at her son who was putting his bag in the luggage carrier, especially when his old habit came up again. Aizawa frowned, looking closer and seeing that Midoriya had some bandages peeking up from his collar. Habit. Inko wrung her hands tightly. When he was little, he used to scratch, she replied. It wasn't from bug bites or allergies since he has none dot 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 he told me he was fine. But he always seemed to be anxious whenever it happened. She sighed. He switched from scratching to mumbling when he got older, but now. Inui nodded to himself. Excoriation is common with anxiety. He said, but at the level where he needs bandages for it is something to look out for. I'll keep track of when he scratches and how badly. A soft growl rumbled from his throat, as well as keep Bakugo away from him. He'd already been privy to the exam footage and was less than pleased about it. Far too many children had come from abusive households and brought their baggage with them into UA. He was already trying to work with Todoroki and avoid hunting Endeavor down like a hound. But any personal witness of abuse from him to Midoriya, and he probably wouldn't be able to hold his attack instincts back. Aizawa rounded the kids up for the bus, instructing Midoriya to sit in the front next to Inui with Bakugo in the back, working his way through assigned seating to balance out a little less suspicion before the two-hour road trip was well on its way. 
Midoriya didn't say much and mostly stared out the window, the tilt of his head making his bandages stick out more and put a knot in Aizawa's gut. Inui's nose twitching let him know that the boy's scratch wounds weren't healed all the way either, the two sharing a look before letting it be and tuning out 1A's rowdiness, letting them get it out of their system before things really took off. Everyone filed off of the bus at the drop-off point, and Aizawa held Midoriya back from the others, lowering his voice. Stay on the bus, he said, leaving no room for argument. Midoriya just nodded and peered out the window at everyone as a car drove up and two members of the Wild Wild Pussycats got out for introduction. After some talk, his class suddenly ran back for the bus only to be thrown back by Pixie Bob's earth flow quirk. Aizawa gestured for Midoriya to come off of the bus. The first task would be to get through the forest and its obstacles, he said. But without instructor's help, we'll be going on ahead and getting things set up for everyone. Midoriya nodded, looking just a little sore at having missed a good start to the day but saying nothing as he got back on the bus for the ride to the camp placement. He was given the specifics of the time to spend in the training. When everyone made it back, they would be given a starter feast and time in the hot springs before bed, and then in the morning they would be training their quirks. For you, though, you'll be training your body, Aizawa said. You have a good handle on what it does, just not being strong enough to wield it. Midoriya nodded his understanding and took to observing the forested area looking oddly interested in the small mountainside in the distance. The initial start to all of it could have gone better. Midoriya arrived, said his hellos and asked what it was he needed to do, and even tried to introduce himself to Mandalay's nephew Koda. Aizawa only saw a spark of violence in the young boy's eyes before his hand swung out on reflex to snap his capture weapon around the boy's wrist, keeping him from striking Midoriya. Midoriya, inside. His student just flushed with embarrassment and hurried in with Inui as Aizawa drew his capture weapon back in. Giving Koda his patented do it again and you'll have detention for a month glare and turning to Mandalay. I can instruct Midoriya to stay away from Koda, but regardless of how old he is, I won't have anyone putting hands on Midoriya with ill intent here, understood. Mandalay nodded and shooed Koda to the kitchen as Pixie Bob shook her head quietly. Dot 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 how bad was it? She asked softly. Bad, Aizawa said. Enough so that if Bakugo does anything else of the sort again, I'll expel him. Midoriya's mental state is too far in the realm of the unknown right now for a repeat of what happened at the exam, and we're waiting on the clearance for a good psychology quirk user to see him. We're too uncertain as to what the stress of essentially being punished for something he doesn't recall would do to him too. So individual work for him, and keeping him separated from Bakugo, Pixie Bob said. Anything else? Hound Dog will keep watch for any sign of heightened anxiety and figure out key factors, Aizawa replied. He'll also help keep Bakugo away and make sure Tiger isn't pressing too hard. He sighed, running a hand through his hair. Midoriya is strong and trying to stay positive here. But while his physical health is important to his studies, his mental health takes priority. Pixie Bob nodded. Fair enough, she said. Midoriya made himself scarce as his classmates filed in looking exhausted and starving. For the past hour, he already assisted the pussycats with cooking, setting up the rooms, and making sure the hot springs stalls were stocked before taking an early dinner and retiring back to the teacher's room. The lack of fuss he was putting up gave Aizawa a bit of worry. He fully expected Midoriya to beg to eat or take a hot springs bath with his friends, but instead the boy was lapsing into antisocial behavior and making himself as scarce as possible. He didn't ever seem to have any friends, and was too easy to lose in a crowd because he kept blending and so he wouldn't be seen, and Ko had told them. Inui paired that with going back to a former anxious habit and concluded that Midoriya was possibly regressing from trauma. Pairing that with a ticking time bomb of psychosis didn't fare well for Midoriya in the long run. Getting through this week as painlessly as possible was the goal before they could return to UA and arrange some in-depth help for Midoriya. Regardless of how much easier things would be with Midoriya distancing himself and keeping close to the teachers, Aizawa knew it wasn't healthy. Solitude would be leaving Midoriya with his own head too much, and who knew how that would turn out. After the rest of Wana was fed and bathed, Aizawa pulled Ida aside to both check on him and get a good gauge of the class's reactions to Midoriya. We did extend an invitation to go shopping, Ida admitted. Although in hindsight dot 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 one of us should have stayed with him. Barely a half hour had passed before we all got a group text saying he wasn't feeling well and decided to head back home. Aizawa frowned, not liking that he hadn't been informed of this from the start. Who was last seen with him? Uraraka. But she said she lost sight of him after going to get bug spray. Ida didn't look any more convinced of that argument as Aizawa felt. I realize now that perhaps going on such a crowded errand was not the best for him, especially if anxiety is a primary factor here. One factor, not primary, Aizawa corrected, rubbing his eyes. And you, are you alright? No scars after recovery girl tended to me. Ida said. It was. I was mostly scared. His eyes shifted to the side, his expression troubled. Ida. The boy winced, unconsciously rubbing his arm where he had been stabbed through. 
Dot 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 it's just. I saw his face for only a second before I was blinded by his attack. Hey, I feel terrible for saying this, but I saw the same insane bloodlust that I saw on Stain's face back in Hasu. His shoulders shook with a visible shudder. Dot 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 it's why I found myself unable to really defend myself, if that makes sense. Aizawa didn't like that additional insinuation of Ida being reminded of Stain of all people when confronted with Midori. But the moment in the exam footage just as Midoriya was attacking, there was a split second of absolute unbridled rage before the boy began screaming his head off in his attack frenzy. That wasn't anxiety. That was pent-up hateful fury unleashed after years of abuse. It was mostly discerning at how someone like Midoriya could even feel and hold onto a dark emotion like that for so long, and for it to fester to the point where Ida had been reminded of the hero killer's bloodlust. The footage indeed did seem to show Midoriya attacking Ida with full intent to maim and even end if need be. It would make sense then, that Midoriya would repress any recollection or memory of having done that, if he felt it so out of his element to think, feel, or do. Dot 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 it makes sense, he told his student. Thank you, Ida. And dot 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 how are the others faring? Ida looked thoughtful for a moment. Todoroki asked me if I was okay first. He said, dot 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 he also asked me to please not hold Midoriya in contempt because he was not being himself when it happened. No one else really wants to talk about it. We dot 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 don't really know what to say. Aizawa nodded quietly. Thank you. Get to bed. We have an early start tomorrow. Ada nodded and hurried off to wrangle the boys into going to sleep, and then sighed and headed to the teacher's room to wind down and get his extra lesson planned together for the remedial students. Midoriya was in his corner on his futon, curled up under a blanket and not moving. Inui gave Aizawa a nod. He's asleep, he said softly. Good, Aizawa murmured back. I'll give him his schedule tomorrow. He sat back in his own corner to get paperwork ready for Vlad to look over in the morning and allowed himself the brief moment of peace before the happy fun time hell began tomorrow morning. Breakfast came first, with Midoriya sitting at the end of a table eating in silence. After the fact, Aizawa led them out to a clearing where he handed Bekugo the same distance reading ball from the quirk assessment and told him to throw it again. Everyone was shocked when they saw that he only improved by maybe a meter. The aim of this training camp was to push everyone's quirk limits way past what they thought possible, something that was normally saved for second years. The arrival of the other two pussycats to aid in everyone's training plus everyone receiving their personalized training schedules definitely made everyone reconsider their life choices up to this point. Training methods were pretty extreme for the most part, such as Beck Hugo dunking his hands in boiling water and expanding his sweat gland, and they were well into their day when one bee showed up to begin their own training under Vlad King's supervision. Midoriya was paired back with others whose quirk focused on physical strength, presided over by Tiger with Hound Dog on standby for Midoriya's sake. As long as he wasn't being hassled or touched, Midoriya went through his grueling exercises in silence. It was an hour later that both Tiger and Inui noticed that Midoriya would sometimes lose focus, faltering for a moment before going back to his training. It took a while and some observation that Midoriya would falter whenever he heard an explosion and loud cursing from Bakugo, who was a quarter kilometer away. We could get him some special earphones that cancels noise, while having Mandalay give him directions, and Yui suggested to Aizawa, who thought about it before nodding. All right, he said, I'll ask Yeyurazu. He went and procured the headphones from his student before going back to where Midoriya was waiting behind the building compound, and then suddenly felt himself pause. Midoriya was staring idly at the small mountain in the distance, eyes unfocused as he absently scratched at his neck, paying no heed to anything around him. The sight made Aizawa's right elbow burn. Flashes of USJ flickering through his peripheral before he shook it off. Now was not the time to be comparing Midoriya to Shigaraki. He handed over the earphones and explained off the expectation. And Midoriya nodded, smiling a little in thanks before tugging them on and getting back to the exercises that Tiger scheduled for him. Aizawa observed for a few minutes before turning to go make notes of his other students, pushing the incident out of his mind. As the day came to a close, Ragdoll told everyone that to close out the day by making a communal meal for themselves, all from scratch. That included breaking the firewood, making the fire, and cooking the food from scratch as well. Exhausted as they were, Kirishima and Midoriya broke the firewood with their own quirks while Todoroki and Yeirazu lit the fires, and everyone else got to cooking, making up a curry together. Midoriya stuck by himself as he had for the day, busying up with setting the tables and carting away dishes to clean as soon as they were finished being used, and looked up as he saw Koda trudging off into the woods toward the mountain. After the food was cooked and set out, he grabbed a spare plate and made his way off after the younger boy. The way up the mountain was simple enough to find once he spotted it, and he saw Koda look up once he got close enough, glaring at him. How did you get here? Koda demanded. I followed you, Midoriya replied with a shrug, putting the plate of curry and rice down. Well get lost. Koda snapped. 
This is my secret base, and you're not invited. He turned from Midoriya, scowling. All that crap about improving your quirks dot 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 what's the point if you're all just gonna die anyway? It's just to have something to brag on about. He didn't hear anything, and turned to see Midoriya sitting on the ledge of the cliffside, staring out at the forest and lightly scratching his chest. If you have something to say, then say it already before I kick you over the side. Midoriya scratched harder. Wouldn't be the first time I've been told to just fall somewhere and die. He replied listlessly, sounding far away. Probably won't be the last, either. Though, it's hard to say which route would be worse. Dying from a fall this high, or having my skull crushed in by a villain. Kota leaned back a little, picking up on a tone definitely more grave than he was used to. Wah, you're so lucky you have a group of heroes to look out for you. Whether you have a powerful quirk or any at all, Midoriya continued. Better than being told how weak, useless, worthless you are. Than being so ready to die at any given moment with only one little thing keeping you hooked on the lifeline. His scratching continued through his speaking. Fingertips curled in to avoid hurting himself too much. So when you finally have a grasp on some semblance of power, something that gives you some strength, some use, some worth, wouldn't you want to make sure you're the best with it? He glanced over at Kota, green eyes dull. Dot 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 it has nothing to do with heroes or villains. This is my power now, and whether or not I die a hero using it or not, isn't any of your business or anyone else's. The only stupid thing I can see anyone doing is going down without a fight. He forced his hand away from his chest before standing up, staring down the mountainside. Yeah, we'll die anyway. Everyone does. But if you want to die so badly, why wait? He crouched down and took a flying leap off of the cliff, hearing Kota yelp in shock above him as he activated one for all and caught his landing in the trees before climbing down and making his way back to camp. He hoped Kota ate, at least. The third day was more or less the same as the previous, with this time only the pussycats announcing an activity between the two hero classes concerning a scare contest with them using their quirks to try to outscare the other class. Interesting as it was, Aizawa still had to weigh out his options. While Bakugo was one of his students in the remedial lessons after hours, Midoriya was the one Aizawa really didn't want to be exposed to something that could inadvertently trigger another episode. That would still leave Ashido, Sato, Kirishima, Siro, and Kaminari in remedial, which would mean Bakugo and Midoriya in the same room, which was not happening on his watch. After reviewing the day's progress for his students and coming to the conclusion that Bakugo didn't deserve any form of leisure until he either graduated or properly learned his lesson, Aizawa let Ashido, Sato, Kirishima, Sira, and Kaminari participate on the grounds that if he didn't see double improvement by the sixth day, he would have them skip the cool-down relaxation day before they left for more remedial lessons and keep Bakugo after for the remedial class while Inui kept an eye on Midoriya back in the rooms. If not a scare fest, see if he can still be creative with his quirk, he told Inui. After telling Midoriya his decision, he found he wanted Midoriya to be disappointed and begging to let him do it. Instead, his worries from the last couple of days were only exacerbated by Midoriya's passive acceptance, albeit with a little more scratching at his chest. During lunch break, Inui voiced his observations. It may be another form of regression, he said, sipping his drink. From what I've witnessed and heard about, Midoriya is a passive person when it comes to general confrontation, and especially when it comes to Bakugo. A sense of feeling he's not able to do anything about it, so why bother? At some point, he's found it best to accept anything that happens. His nose twitched slightly with worry. It's a dangerous mindset to have, and makes him mentally malleable. It would be bad enough if he did not just have a psychotic break. Aizawa sighed, rubbing his face hard. God damn it, he muttered. Even with some form of newfound confidence coming to Yue, it's already been pounded into his head that might makes right. Back Hugo hit him, he has a mental breakdown. And even then, the first thing he does is try to get away. He was running on pure instinct when Edder reached out to him, figuring that if he couldn't escape, he's making escape. Even if it was putting someone down for good. He squeezed his eyes shut. Makes me wonder if that's how his quirk is reacting dot 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 make it passive or go all out and be rid of the threat if it's not going away. Sit, no wonder he can't help but break himself. I'm sure it's more than just that factor at work, Inui said. But yes, I also think that his unbalanced state of mind does make for an imbalance in his quirk. He doesn't know how to keep a steady meter of how low or high his emotions and output should run. I'd even go so far as to say he wasn't in his right mind at all when he fought Todoroki in the sports festival. It wasn't just adrenaline that kept him going. He was forcing an outcome that shouldn't have even happened. I shudder to think what would have happened if he won that match and moved on to fight back Hugo. Aizawa shook his head, glancing over to where Midoriya was silently eating his meal with his noise-canceling headphones still on. I don't like him being stuck in his own head, he said quietly. Dot 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 if he doesn't have any improvement tomorrow. I'm sending him back home. He needs a lot more help than we can give him. Inui nodded. Agreed, he said. I'm hoping at least somewhat that at least being out here with everyone albeit at his own mental pace helps. 
even just a little. But dot 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 as you said, we'll see. The day wound down and everyone finished dinner of beef stew with rice, and then the pussycats began calling for everyone to get ready for that night's scare contest, with class 1B going first for scares. Aizawa took Bakugo away for the remedial class while Inui led Midoriya to the rooms. Midoriya didn't say much about it, though Inui saw the boy glance back at the clearing where everyone else was situated and excited, and took pause in leading him off. Something on your mind? He asked. Midoriya was quiet before shaking his head. Inui sighed. You can speak your mind, he nudged. It's okay to be wary or disappointed or afraid. Midoriya stared off into space, his fingers trailing up to his chest. Dot 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 is it? He asked, glancing away from the crowd and toward the mountain. I can't help what I feel. No one can dot 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 but it doesn't mean what I feel matters. Dot 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 how do you mean? Dot 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 well dot 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 if I said I felt disappointed about not being a part of the group, would it allow me to be a part of the scaring contest? Midoriya's fingers scratched lightly. If I said I had reservations about Kakin being here, would he be sent home? If I said I wanted this, effing itching to go away. His fingers scratched harder, and Inui felt a hard tank in the boy's mood in an instant. Dot 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 does it mean it'll just go away? He scowled, eyes filling with tears as he stared at the mountain. Dot 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 why am I even still here? What point is it you're all trying to make with me being here? Inui stepped closer. Think back, Midoriya, he said. You said you felt like you were still ready to come here, and your feelings were taken into consideration. But we need to find a balance for what you say and for what you actually feel. Right now, the day is over and a semblance of schooling or a school atmosphere is out. If you want to scream, by all means scream. If you want to rant and curse, go ahead and do it. Be honest with yourself, without worrying about what someone else thinks. Can you do that, even for a short while, right now? Midoriya bit his lip hard, his one hand still scratching while the other arm curled around his middle, almost shrinking in on himself. I, I want it to stop. He murmured, his breath quickening slightly. I want it to stop. I want the itching to stop. Do you know what's causing the itching? Inui asked calmly. Midoriya clenched his eyes shut, taking a shallow, shaking breath. Dot 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 yes. Inui nodded. Okay, what's causing the itch? It's called being quirkless. You really are a Deku now. Could you be any more useless, Deku? Jeez, Deku, can't you do anything? He won't die if he dodges. Stop following me. Not another goddamn word, you sit. All of the above with nothing but pain sprinkled in for flavor. It tasted disgusting in his mouth. If it came to that, Inui would do everything including rendering Midoriya unconscious completely in order to get some immediate help. But Midoriya was completely silent, taking his time walking through the woods toward a path that came apparent closer to the foot of the mountain as the sun was set completely, the moon illuminating the rest of the way to a cleared cut path that led up the mountain. By some good fortune, Inui saw that at least Midoriya wasn't looking wistfully over the side, and instead keeping his focus ahead, the trek was thankfully short. And Inui saw Mandalay's cousin Koda sitting by a cavern and staring out over the forest. The small boy looked up, scowling apprehensively at Midoriya. And Inui, what are you doing here? He demanded. Midoriya quietly walked to a clear spot of rock and sat down, doing his own staring out at the forest. Waiting, he replied. Inui and Koda had identical confused expressions, with both intently curious but neither wanting to ask what it was he was waiting for. Ten minutes passed before Inui's nose began to burn with the far-off scent of something on fire. He exhaled through his nose sharply to get the burn out and looked out over the forest, 
thinking that one of the students might have accidentally had their quirk go off when he saw flickers of blue flames beginning to spread over the forest. A quick rack of his mental student file came up with not one of the students down there capable of creating blue flames, and his guard snapped up immediately. Midoriya, Kota, we have to get back to camp immediately. He barked, hurrying over to the younger boy to scoop him up. Knowing Kota's short legs couldn't keep up with his dog-like speed or Midoriya's power boost. Midoriya, let's go. I can't. Inui stared at Midoriya, who hadn't moved an inch from where he sat, staring out at the burning forest with the blue reflection of the fire being the only real light in his eyes. Midoriya, this is an emergency. We have to get back to the others and help. I can't leave. Midoriya's hand trailed to his chest, scratching lightly. Dot 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 when you feel you want to make the itching stop dot 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 go to the mountain. That's what he told me. Inui felt the fur on the back of his neck bristle with deep-seated dread. Dot 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 who told you that? He asked before his ear twitched hearing heavy footsteps come from around the side of the mountain. Everyone, this is Mandalay, came the urgent voice of the heroine's telepath. Two villains have been spotted near camp, but there may be more. Return to camp immediately. I repeat, villains in the camp, return and regroup immediately. Koda was shaking in Inui's arms as Mandalay's message was drowned out by a large cloaked figure coming to view, prompting a low, warning growl from Inui at the newcomer, his instincts picking up a massive amount of bloodlust. Well well, the cloaked figure said, I come up here to get a good view, and I find a kid, a mutt dot 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 and one of our targets. The man's masked face turned in Midoriya's direction. Inui could feel Koda shaking in his arms, prompting him to bare his teeth and snarl at the man in warning. The man scoffed and reached up, taking the mask off. Down, mutt, or I'll put you down, he said, amusement glimmering in his one actual eye before looking back down to Midoriya, who had yet to move from his spot. Really don't get what he wants with this brat. He looks brain dead. He took a step over, only to have Inui jump in his path, growling savagely. Back off, Inui snapped, mind racing for some way out of this. His best option so far was to give Koda to Midoriya and have them escape while he held this villain off. But with Midoriya not reacting to anything right now, there was a slim chance of that happening. A villain appearing out of nowhere with more out there and the goddamn forest on fire would be something that would render Midoriya catatonic. Stalling it was, then, what are you doing here? He demanded. What is it you want from children? The villain snorted. I personally don't care what the hell the hand fetish freak really wants, he replied. All I know is, we were sent to retrieve two kids and do whatever with the others until they were found. If the hero wannabes die, then they die. He glanced at Midoriya, and this brat is one of them. He lifted an arm, muscle fibers crawling over his skin. So I'll tell you what, I'll give you a 10 second head start for you and the littlest brat to get out of here before I come after you and crack your skulls open like grapes. If you can get down the mountain by that time, I'll just take my catch and go. If not dot 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 well dot 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 his grin turned savage. I wonder how big a splatter that little one can make with enough force. Sit. Inui had a split second decision to make. He could either try to snatch Midoriya and run too, get Kota running ahead and stay behind for Midoriya, or leave Midoriya and take Kota on his own. The villain said that Midoriya was wanted by the League for capture, not kill. But abandoning his one duty here to Midoriya was something he didn't think he could ever forgive himself for, or have others forgive him for. Let them go. Everyone turned to see Midoriya standing up, his expression still void of any real emotion. He turned to the villain. Dot 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 if Shigaraki sent you dot 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 then I'll go with you. He told me if I wanted the itching to stop, to come up here. This is what he meant, right? And knew he felt his ears flatten. This was why Midoriya came up here. Because of S-H-I-G-A-R-A-K-I. Midoriya, what are you saying? I'm saying, go back to camp. Midoriya made a weak gesture toward the burning forest with one hand. The other scratching at his chest. Dot 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 it's fine. Midoriya, it is not fine. You're not going to be leaving with villains. I don't know what it is you think you're doing, but we need to get out of here and get to Aizawa. The villain stepped up. Your ten seconds are up, by the way. His arm shot out, grabbing for Kota before his wrist was snatched in a vice grip by Midoriya. The F, I said. Midoriya muttered, his other hand scratching harder, accompanied by a facial tick of irritation. Let them go. His eyes flicked to Inui who felt a surge of instinctual warning alarms going off at the flicker of mania he saw in them. Go, Midoriya. Inui was cut off when Midoriya's legs shot out and Sparta kicked him off the side of the mountain, Koda's terrified cries echoing on the way down. Midoriya stared over the side of the mountain, his scratching slowing down somewhat. Dot 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 well. He addressed the villain. Take me to Shigaraki. The villain snarled, glowering at Midoriya. You don't make the decisions around here. He snapped, snapping his arm out and throwing Midoriya into the side of the mountain. So shut up and stay there, before I crush your legs no matter what that hand effer has to say. Midoriya slumped to the ground, hardly hearing the villain through the stinging static that was clouding his brain. 
and through the static, he remembered, being bashed across the face. Not another goddamn word, you sit. Just because things are going good for you doesn't mean that you should speak to me. Agonized itching, crawling away, scraping himself against the ground to try to find some form of relief. Scratching, choking, sobbing. Dot 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 in rage. The itching came back with a wretched vengeance, almost putting Midoriya down for good, but unlike last time, he had something new. Clarity. Dot 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 does it ever stop? Dot 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 not until what caused it is gone. His fingers clawed holes into his shirt, scraping against his skin as his vision tunneled straight to the man dot 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 the thing dot 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 that was making him itch, and he wanted it gone. A warp gate opened up in the side of the mountain, Shigaraki stepping out to peruse over the fiery chaos below. Dot 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 try not to burn our own down with the hero brats, you ugly lunatic, he muttered before his nose caught the stench of blood past the smell of the forest burning. He walked around the curve of the mountain before stopping and staring at the cause. Blood painted the wall of the mountain. A large flattened and clawed up carcass laid out to the side as a smaller form was curled up in a small nook in the side of the mountain wall shaking violently. Shigaraki observed the scene before stepping around the body and walking over to Midoriya, staring down quietly. The boy was covered in blood, none more so than his hands that were clenching into his matted hair, his breaths coming out in short, uncontrolled wheezes. His eyes stared straight ahead, overflowing with tears. Shigaraki silently sat down next to him, looking like he was enjoying the serenity of carnage and conflagration with psychotic panic as company. Breathe, Shigaraki said quietly, repeating the word until Midoriya's breathing became more even with longer breaths. He glanced over at the boy, seeing Midoriya pull his knees up and bury his face in them. Dot 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 did the itching stop. Midoriya was silent for several long moments before movement of his head indicated a small nod. Dot 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 is dead, he replied, his voice hoarse and shaking. Shigaraki smiled behind father. Bakugos has not, he concluded, seeing another tiny nod. He hummed thoughtfully before standing to his feet, looking down on the still shaking boy. I promised you, yes, that if you came here, the itching would stop dot 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 or rather, I would give you what you needed for it to stop. He reached down, tucking his thumb in while still extending his hand out to Midoriya. I still intend to make that so. Midoriya looked up at the hand, his own shaking hard before he reached out and took Shigaraki's, letting the man pull him to his feet before leading him off by the hand to where the warp gate was still open. His eyes flickered to the destroyed villain on the ground. Dot 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 you're not mad about. He trailed off. Shigaraki didn't give Muscular's corpse a second look. Who am I to get mad at you destroying what you hated? He replied flippantly. Let's go. Your method of escaping the itch should arrive soon. He led Midoriya through the warp. A wide smile behind father as it closed behind them. Aizawa could feel his lungs and legs burning as he ran up the mountain path. The fact that he'd bypassed fire smoke and a hint of poison gas not helping that fact at all. Just minutes ago, he'd run across an injured Inui carrying Kota through the woods, the counselor looking like he'd broken his leg and suffered heavy lacerations while Kota was trembling, traumatized. Midoriya is up on the mountain, and Inui had told him. A villain was there, was going to take him Midoriya kicked me off the mountain before we were killed. Inui's report was muddled, with the man having obviously hit his head at some point, but the implications were clear. The villains here were looking for students to capture or kill, and Midoriya was obviously of the former. Midoriya chose to get Inui and Kota out of the way of harm albeit over the side of a mountain and stayed a fight on his own. Aizawa only prayed he wasn't too late. He jumped the last few meters onto the ledge, and he calling out to Midoriya catching in his throat when he saw the blood. So much of it. A large body in indescribable condition was in the middle of it all, with recognizable indicators of massive blunt force trauma and tear marks that looked to have come from fingers covering every visible inch of skin. He couldn't even tell if it was a well-known villain or not because there was no face to go by. No face, and a caved-in skull. Aizawa had seen and felt a lot of brutality in his career, but this actually made him vomit over the side of the mountain before forcing himself around the corpse to look for Midori. He called for the boy, hating how his voice was shaking and becoming more frantic as it was clear that Midori was not on the mountain, or anywhere that he could see. Everyone, Mandalay's telepath came in. We've identified that the villains are after Bakugo and Midori. Bakugo and Midori, do not fight, hurry back to camp immediately. Aizawa barely heard her through his blood pounding in his ears as he found himself vomiting again. This time from the realization that he'd been far too late, both from getting here and realizing that Midoriya should never have come here in the first place. The only thing he could do now was run back down the mountain and pray that Bakugo wasn't already captured too. Bakugo slowly came to, feeling a vice-like pounding in his temples and a stiffness in his arms. His eyes opened, lids feeling like they weighed a kilogram apiece, and tried to mentally answer several questions that were coming in one by one. The last thing he remembered was fighting some freak with blades coming out of his mouth with Isaha, 
and then Shoji came running out of the woods with Dark Shadow on his tail, screaming at either of them to give some light. Dark Shadow was slashing and roaring at anything that moved, including the villain that was attacking. Dot 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 and then at some point, everything was cut off and now here he was. Bakugo looked down, feeling a spike of rage when he saw he was bound in Quirk's oppressant cuffs, strapped to a restraining chair with a leather gag over his mouth. He tugged at the cuffs, the chain clinking loudly but having no give in them. Oh good, you're awake. His head snapped up, seeing the hand freak from USJ sitting at a bar with some playing cards staring at him. He growled behind his gag, glaring with the promise of a thousand C4s worth of explosions. Shigaraki wasn't phased at all by the glare, and turned his attention away for a moment to tent two more cards on his stack. I'm sure you're wondering why you're here, Shigaraki said conversationally. Won't lie, I originally wanted you here for a completely different reason. He held up a card, examining it for a moment. I can sort of see where you're coming from with your less than pleasant disposition. You know, you're strong, powerful, and like winning while destroying anything in your path. His cold red eye flicked to the side under the hand's palm, pinning Bakugo in place. I can get behind that, destroying something in your way. It's annoying, isn't it? He turned his attention back to his house of cards, putting the card over two peaks. But there's something I don't really get, something that just sort of gets under my skin with you. Here you are, a strong, powerful kid with praises and glorification all your life dot 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 with a loving, supportive family and an entourage who thinks the sun shines out of your ass dot 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 you would think that it would be an acknowledgement of your greatness, wouldn't it? He made a thoughtful sound before flicking the house of cards down and standing up, turning fully toward Bakugo. I want to ask you three questions, Bakugo, he said, walking over and reaching out with two fingers apiece each hand to the clasps on either side of the leather gag, and by all means, answer honestly. I'm curious. He tugged the gag down before stepping back, putting his hands behind his back. F you, Bakugo shouted, spitting accumulated saliva forward, barely missing Shigaraki's shoes. When I get out of these, there won't be anything solid left to pick up. Fair enough, Shigaraki replied with a shrug. Now, for my questions. He pulled a stool from the bar over to sit in front of Bakugo. My first question, would you give any real thought to joining me? Bakugo visibly bristled, blood in his eye. Eat sit and die. He snarled. Next question, Shigaraki continued, unaffected. Do you really think you behave like a hero should? Let me out of these restraints and find out. Bakugo growled, giving Shigaraki a toothy smile. I'll show you just how heroic I am when I launch your corpse through the police station door. Noted. Now, last question. Though, this one comes with a few demonstrations. Shigaraki grabbed a remote from his pocket and turned to the television, turning it on and pressing a few settings before bringing up a file video that Bakugo recognized as footage from ground beta. Watch carefully, you'll get a quiz question later. Shigaraki pressed play. Bakugo watched the footage of him entering the frame, heading down to meet All Might for the exam with Midoriya in tow. He saw Midoriya hurrying up and then himself whip around and bash him back to the ground, saying some parting words and walking on ahead. This was what they stopped the exam for, Bakugo realized, still having not been told how or why. He watched Midoriya remain on the ground motionless for several moments before crawling away, scraping his body along the pavement. The other boy seemed to be sobbing and heaving like he was going to be violently ill, the crawling and scraping looking incredibly disturbing to look at. After a shock wave from All Might sent Midoriya flying into a model car, the boy continued his crawl-scraping trek, a look of empty, blind agony twisting his features, even when All Might hurried over to assess the situation. When All Might reached out to touch him, Bakugo felt his stomach lurch when Midoriya began screaming, almost hearing it through the silence of the visual-only footage, clawing away like an animal. When Ida arrived with Recovery Girl, it only got worse as Ida reached out for Midoriya and was subsequently attacked. Bakugo had only seen something like that on nature documentaries, of a violent, wild creature attacking something bigger than it was with full intent to kill. Bakugo could see it on Midoriya's rage-blind face the other boy was attacking Ida with the intention of killing him before he was pulled away by All Might, still kicking, clawing, and screaming. And even after Aizawa hurried over with restraints he still screamed and struggled until midnight and Recovery Girl sedated him. Shigaraki reached up and pressed stop on the remote, humming thoughtfully. A nasty reaction from being hit. Really? Now then, he stood in front of Bakugo, getting the boy's attention. My last question. Do you regret doing what you did to make that happen? Bakugo snapped out of whatever stupor he had been in watching that, glaring up at Shigaraki. What I did? He snapped. I didn't do anything I haven't ever done before. Whatever the F was wrong with Deku is all on him. Shigaraki's eyes were unreadable from behind the corpse hand's fingers, staring for what seemed like a full minute before he reached back into his pocket and pulled out a phone, browsing through it. Figured as much, he said, his thumb tapping through some apps before finding something. I know you're kind. Katsuki Bakugo dot 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 some of you guys are good enough on my side. No issue. 
But the fact remains the same, whether you're a hero, a villain, or some punk with delusions of grandeur. He leaned in closer, eyes hardening. You think that your actions don't have consequences, simply because you are you. He held up his phone. This, Beck Hugo, is the consequence of your actions, of years worth of them. Back Hugo's eyes widened when he saw a graphic, disgusting image of a torn, beaten, bloody corpse on the phone screen, able to even see goddamn brain matter through a flattened skull. He grimaced, turning his head. The f are you talking about? He snapped. I didn't do that sit. Shigaraki turned the screen back to himself, looking over it appraisingly. Perhaps you didn't strike those blows. He said before pocketing the phone, but you did strike blows nonetheless, didn't you? He leaned in closer, his unblinking red eyes drilling into Back Hugo's own. Is that a hero's creed nowadays? That as long as you have power, you can rain down as many blows as you want onto the weaker without consequence. He scoffed. Do you even know how many of us are here because of a creed like that? Because of people like you. He stood upright. Your victim is no different. He turned his head to a door behind him. Come on in. I know you were listening. Back Hugo's eyes flicked to the door, feeling his guts crawl when he saw Midoriya walk in. Deku, the leather gag being shoved back over his mouth kept him from speaking further. Only able to jerk in his restraints as Midoriya stood by the bar, keeping his eyes averted in distance fair. It's alright, Midoriya, Shigaraki said, smiling from behind father. He can't get out, and he can't hurt you. He let out a soft chuckle at Midoriya's dubious look. I promise. He left Bakugo's side anyway, walking over and putting a hand on Midoriya's shoulder. I told you, didn't I? His kind feels they can do no wrong, if no one is there to stop them. Bakugo shouted through his gag, seeing Midoriya's hollow eyes tear up from Shigaraki's words. He struggled harder in his restraints, feeling an impending trickle of doom creep down his back as he inadvertently recalled the many blows to Midoriya's body, paired to the more recent lifeless husk of a boy he'd seen glimpses of in the training camp the past few days. The recording of what had happened after he left Midoriya on the ground only made that crawl on his spine turn to ice, wondering how the hell that could have happened, or even when or how Shigaraki got a hold of Midoriya to begin with. He let out a louder shout through the gag that went unacknowledged, seeing Shigaraki giving him a sidelong look of amusement before putting both hands pinkies up on Midoriya's shoulders and guiding him over to Bakugo. Do you still itch, Midoriya? Bakugo's brow furrowed at the absurd question before he noticed that Midoriya's hands were busy scratching at his arms, red marks already visible. And over his neck and collarbones, there were old scab scratch marks as well, some of which looking almost new. Midoriya nodded, a desperation glinting in his eyes. Yes, he said, so softly that Bakugo almost hadn't heard it. And what did I tell you? Dot 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 that the only way to make the itch go away dot 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 is to make what caused it go away. Shigaraki's grin was visible even behind the corpse hand. Muscular made you itch, didn't he? Yes. And what did you do about it? Midoriya's fingernails wrenched in his arms, blood trickling down his elbow and into the floor. I made it stop. The picture that Shigaraki had shown Bakugo a few minutes ago suddenly made that much more sense and he felt that he had just failed the biggest exam of his short life. Shigaraki laughed softly, giving Midoriya's shoulders a squeeze before letting go and stepping back until he was around the bend of the bar. He won't stop if you let him go, he said, his voice convincingly truthful. He'll keep hitting you, screaming at you, digging that itch deeper and deeper into your skin, twisting the knife while no one does anything to stop him. Bakugo shouted through his gag again, shaking his head wildly as he tried to catch Midoriya's eye to convince him himself. He'll just keep hurting you. Over and over and over, until you scratch yourself to pieces, until there's nothing left for him to hit or scream at. Shigaraki slipped his phone out of his pocket again, bringing up the camera function. His thumb poised over the wreck button. Midoriya's fingers stilled, blood staining his nails as his shoulders slumped. His head lifted, eyes like chips of emerald ice as he stared at Bakugo. Bakugo stared back, trying to convey without words that it wasn't true, that Shigaraki was full of sit and that they needed to get out of here. There was a beat of silence before Midoriya reached up to pull the gag off of Bakugo's mouth. Bakugo inhaled sharply, jerking on his restraints. Deku, get these things off of me. He shouted, we have to get the F out of. A sharp blow to his face cut him off, the sensation almost numb before Bakugo felt blood dripping down open wounds on his face. His mouth opened, but he was unable to form words to say anything for the longest time. Duh, Midoriya's hands clasped on either side of his face, nails pressing in deep enough to pierce the skin, the thumbnails dangerously close to Bakugo's eyes. Midoriya's own eyes were wide, without a hint of fear or even anger. It was like an infant discovering a new sensation for the first time in its life, a realization that it could do something. His nails pressed in deeper, hands trembling softly with a crackle of power that Bakugo could feel. An image of having his head literally ripped in half came forward with enough visual accuracy to almost make Bakugo vomit with the realization that with the threatening crackle of power pressed against his skin, it was a very real thing that Midoriya could do. Shigaraki let out a hiss of laughter through his teeth. 
Go on, Midoriya, he murmured. Scratch the itch. He pressed wreck. When All Might burst into the bar with the other heroes, they were stunned to find it empty. This is the place, Gran Torino insisted, keeping his guard up as they looked around. Not finding a thing out of the ordinary except for an open laptop propped up on a shelf. After a quick sweep of the area, Edshot peered closer and called their attention over. On the keypad was a sticky note with Play Me written on it. After a muttering from Gran Torino about Gotham villains playing games and a wary look between the other three heroes, All Might reached over to move the mouse on the screen. The black screensaver vanishing to show a video already pulled up and paused. After a moment of deliberation, All Might pressed play. A slightly shaky video showed the very bar they were standing in. The camera pointed to a person standing a short distance away. All Might inhaled sharply, recognizing Midoriya's green hair, seeing the boy standing in front of someone, his back trembling before his hands suddenly snapped from in front of him to his sides. A scream he recognized as Bakugo's tore through the laptop speakers as he saw Midoriya's fingers were covered in blood. Got him effing D-E-K-U. Bakugo screamed, chains on restraints rattling, and Midoriya shifted enough that the heroes could see the sides of Bakugo's head and under his eyes bleeding. Stop effing around. Yugi was cut off when Midoriya slammed his fist into his solar plexus, making him double over and gag for air. The assault didn't even pause now. Midoriya grabbed Bakugo's hair and slammed his head back against the restraint chair hard, then grabbed the quirk restraint cuff and pulled Bakugo's arms out straight before jerking his knee up into the elbows, breaking both arms in one go. The heroes could only watch in horror as Midoriya tore the leather straps restraining Bakugo back off with his bare hands and threw the other boy to the floor, tearing and punching savagely at him in the same way All Might recalled Midoriya had done to Ida back then. But there was no one there to stop it this time, rather, there was no one who would stop it. At some point, Bakugo's screams vanished. Finally, they could all see Midoriya stop punching at what little left there was to punch, and the person holding the camera let out a sigh of near contentment. Easy now, the voice said, and All Might felt his stomach drop when he recognized it as Shigaraki's. The camera shifted to be set down propped up on the bar, and Shigaraki came into view, walking over to Midoriya and kneeling down, paying no mind to the mess that was made as he held Midoriya's shoulder quietly. Is the itch gone? He said, deliberately raising his voice to be heard. Next to him, Midoriya nodded, and allowed himself to be helped up. When Shigaraki turned him toward a door, the heroes could see a smile on his face, tears running down his cheeks, looking like the weight of the universe had been lifted from his shoulders. Shigaraki led him across the room, stopping by the camera. Go get washed up, and have Dabai wrap your hands, he said. We'll take care of the mess. Midoriya's footsteps trailed off with the sound of a door shutting, and Shigaraki picked the camera back up, his red eyes glinting with unconcealed mirth. This is what happens when you heroes fail in what really matters, the villain said, his voice quivering with emotion both elated and angry. When you let someone with a powerful quirk get away with murder, so long as that potential isn't wasted, isn't it a tragedy, or is it a comedy? He aimed the camera at the laptop they were all watching now, uploading the footage from the training ground online with a timed post date of that day two minutes ago before turning the camera back to himself. I'll let the public decide, and don't worry about Midoriya. He's with his own kind now, the ones who were beaten down and tossed aside like he was. We'll take good care of him. The screen went to black, and then the heroes saw that there was an upload notification that this very video had just been posted up to a hero video circulation site. While Gran Torino raced to the hole in the building to scream down at Tsukachi to start finding and taking down the videos, the other heroes only watching as All Might's light faded from his eyes. Shigaraki grinned at his phone, seeing notification after notification pop up about the videos circulating around the internet now. Forum posts and essay-long comments about the decline of hero morals and standards giving him enough reading material for weeks to come. Oh, he just couldn't wait to see how UA and the commission would spin this. He looked up from his phone to his new pet project, seeing Midoriya in his own little world watching video footage of heroes and villains alike filling notebooks with quirk analysis about them and looking like a content little child doing so. The boy's fascination with quirks seemed to rival even his own masters, something that he found could make use of Midoriya without causing more psychological distress that was most definitely to come from this particular walk of life. Quirk analysis, though, was Midoriya's safe haven, and being away from people he deemed may hurt him mostly anyone he didn't particularly know. Having regressed to a mindset of still being a little quirkless weakling put him in a cocoon of contentment, Sensei said that he would see what he could do about the boy's fragile mentality. But until then, Shigaraki was tasked with keeping him safe and calm. 
pretty easy to do with a computer screen and a pile of empty notebooks. Throw in some occasional food, and it was almost too easy. Seriously, how could heroes or civilians screw this up? Shigaraki went back to his phone, smiling softly at the sound of the boy's mile-a-minute muttering and pencil scratching against the paper, noting that since that night, Midoriya hadn't scratched himself once. Now, Shigaraki himself had just one more big itch for himself to scratch. And thanks to Midoriya, it would be almost child's play to get rid of. Okay sadly the chapter is over. And if you enjoyed the video just leave a like. And subscribe with post notification. So when the next chapter is ready, you will be notified. Okay see you in the next video. Bye.